we go. Thank you. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's lecture for the Society for Theatre Research. Tonight we'll be listening to Professor Russell Jackson speaking to us about the master himself, Noel Coward, and the importance of editing Noel. Um, professor Jackson is Emeritus Professor at the University of Birmingham and has a remarkable range of expertise and publication across a wide range of authors and theatrical events, uh, including the Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare on Film, Shakespeare's Films in the Making, Vision, Production and Reception, both Cambridge 2007, Theatres on Film, How the Cinema Imagines the Stage, Manchester 2013, Shakespeare and the English Speaking Cinema, Oxford 2014, and a book on Trevor Nunn called Shakespeare in the Theatre, Trevor Nunn, most recent indeed in 2018. He is recently the editor of the Cambridge Companion of Shakespeare on Screen. And uh, we are proud to say that he received the Society for Theatre Research Denning Award in support of research for Noel Coward, the playwright's craft in a change in theatre. Now, this is the first book length critical study to draw extensively on script material from the archive. And this will be published by Matthew and Drama in May 2022. So I think, Professor Jackson, you're going to give us a little taste of um, what may be some of the treasures in the book, we hope. And now I'm going to hand over to you. As usual, our audience, we will have some time for questions at the end of Professor Jackson's talk. And you'll need to unmute yourself. There, hello. <laughs> Welcome to Edge Baston. Um, I'm going to be talking about aspects of Coward's work that might lead one to think it's a good idea to think about editing the plays. And that's why there's a question mark in my title. Maybe we shouldn't think about that. I'm going to, first of all, acknowledge the great support that I've had, not just from the Society for Theatre Research, but also from the Noel Coward Archive Trust and its, uh, its chair, Alan Brodie, uh, the staff of the Cabaret Research Library at the University of Birmingham, particularly Mark Eccleston, and in London at the Noel Coward Room and Library, where Robert Hazel, the Learning and Archive Officer, and Carrie Klotwagen, the Collections Archivist, have been enormously helpful. These are delightful archives to work in, and um, I will try to make sure that uh, the details of access to them are available. Um, I haven't got them on the screen this, this evening. Uh, the Birmingham one is easy because you go to the University of Birmingham website, go to the libraries, collections, and you can actually find the whole finding list. Now, the point about this is that between these two segments, segment is the wrong word because there's an enormous amount of primary material, unpublished material, still in copyright. Um, and I'm very grateful to the, the, the trust for allowing, allowing me to use this material in the book, but also it's something that gives you a wonderful sense of the very rich life of Noel Coward. I'm going to start by quoting something that shows Coward's self-awareness uh, self about which was massive. He knew exactly what was going on with his reputation, who should not. But it's a wonderful moment in Present Laughter when the character Gary is Gary Essendine, it's clearly is obviously it's Noel Coward, um, is having to deal with an intrusive young avant-garde playwright called Roland Moore. And Roland says, amongst many other things, you have a great following and a strong personality, and all you do is prostitute yourself every night of your life. All you do with your talent is to wear dressing gowns and make witty remarks when you might be really helping people, making them think, making them feel. To which Gary says, there can be no two opinions about it. I'm having a most dis discouraging morning. Now, that sense of his own image is something that will recur in what I'll be talking about this evening. But let's begin at the beginning. 
why would one edit Noel Coward? There are good editions available of his plays. Notably, recent years, the Methuen collected plays and other texts of Noel Coward, which you see here on the shelf. It's conveniently arranged. Well, I'd like to go back to the example of Oscar Wilde, and it's a personal story. The new Mermaid editions that Jackson and Small, Ian Small and myself, did in the early 80s were influenced very much by the work of Joseph Donoghue, with projects he first aired in the 1970s and which came to fruition in his extraordinary edition of The Importance of Being Earnest, editions actually, and also of translation of Salome. Or Salome. Um, one thing that they alerted the public to was the complexity of the origins of the texts of the society plays, especially the importance of being earnest. And not just a matter of earnest being in four acts or three acts, but even more than that. Now, one of the things that happened to, my, to me, which is a little bit of theatre history, is that I sat down next to Roma Gill, who is the editor, general, one of the general editors of New Mermaid drama series, in 1978, to see Anthony and Cleopatra at the Shakespeare the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, just before the lights down went down, Roma turned to me and said, um, Peter Thompson tells me I should ask you about editing She Stoops to Conquer, and then the lights went down. And it was Glenda Jackson as not really a very serpentine serpent of old Nile. And the lights went up at the interval and I turned to her and I said, no, but I would like to do the importance of being earnest. And Roma, who was an extraordinarily learned and experienced editor of early modern drama, said, oh, well, that's easy. All you have to do is get a copy of the play and write some notes. Yes, not quite. Up to a point, Lord Copper. So that is an example of the way we tend to think about the plays that exist in considerably well-established editions. It applies to Morm, it applies to um, Rattigan and to Coward as being somehow, we've got there, we have them. Yes, that's true, but not quite true. But what about Coward? We have access to this collected edition. The cost per volume of a new edition would be prohibitive. I can't imagine the market's perception of need uh, would, would be other than that it was rather limited. The market for all but a limited number of plays would also be limited, if you see what I mean. Um, a hard question, should we be asking about the importance of Noel Coward himself? Well, I'm convinced that we should, and that Coward is a, a remarkable dramatist, a fine dramatist, a great dramatist, but is also a vital force in theatre in the 20th century. His first plays were published just, first plays performed um, in the West End, that is the first West End performance, um, 102 years ago. Um, and some of the plays have survived into the repertoire quite happily since then. Some have not. Some, one might think, are not worth reviving or that we wouldn't want to revive them now. And this is something that we'd need to address in, other, in another context in considering Coward's reputation and also the worth of some of Coward's writing and the attitudes in it. I'm not going to go into that too much this evening. I'm going to move into this area of what you might call textual criticism, which can be a frightening notion to some people, but is actually the very root of what one does with play texts. And as all of us know, I'm sure, a play text depends on performance, is a pretext for performance, and as Coward himself knew very well from his own experience, changes in performance, changes in production. Coward never stuck in one place. On the other hand, he was intolerant of actors who got anything particularly wrong in what the words that had been arrived at already by the time of production. He was a stickler for actors learning the scripts before rehearsal, didn't always get that, um, surprise, surprise, and he was a stickler for them sticking to it, and he didn't always get that. Still, we might want or need a new edition, and you don't always get what you want, and you sometimes get what you need, as somebody once said. But there's, what we might want from a new edition would be establishing the text. It wouldn't necessarily mean that the Methuen texts or others were wrong in a large sense, but we might need feel that we need to collate them with the first published or produced scripts 
and later productions or publications that were approved by Coward. And I'll be looking at some of these with examples on screen um, later. Then there's the question of what you need to annotate. Social conventions, they're not transparent nowadays, even if people are devotees of Downton Abbey and know all about servants, not to mention upstairs, downstairs a little while ago, um, or Jeeves and Worcester, social conventions, servants, how they behave, how they're supposed to behave, are something that readers and actors need to work on in terms of performing the texts and performing them in the, in the mind, understanding what's going on because unexpected behavior depends on expectations. This all may seem fairly straightforward, but I remember we discovered with the wild scripts that things did need explaining of that kind. The politics and personalities of the time are important too. One of my favorites is the Duke of Westminster's yacht, which you'll remember in, in Private Lives, um, there's the whole question of whose yacht is that in the Duke of Westminster's, is it, maybe it's the Duke of Westminster's, it usually is. And at the end of the first act, um, Sybil and Victor have no idea whose yacht it might be. And that's an important distinction between them and the Elliot and Amanda. Um, but the Duke of Westminster's yacht, many readers and many in audiences nowadays are unlikely to know that it is very specific. It's Bender, Duke of Westminster, one of the richest men in the world, and certainly in Europe and in Britain, and his yacht, um, notorious. And uh, that's something that, okay, it's a footnote, but it's something that you need to know in order to pitch exactly the degree of knowingness and sophistication of those two couples, as if that wasn't clear enough to begin with. Anyone who, any, anyone who is calling Elliot Ellie is clearly, there are problems. Then there's the welfare state. As a beneficiary of that, um, I have no problem understanding it, but the welfare state figures in Coward's work as something that is suspe suspect. Um, he re re regarded the restrictions and taxation of the post-war years as too onerous. Um, it was a, he was a reactionary in that sense, as many middle-class, upper-middle-class, upper-class people were, and attitudes to it turn up again and again in the plays written after the Second World War. And then there's the end of empire. Now that's a hot topic at the moment. And Coward would figure in many people's view as in what you might call to use the, na the name of the old political party an empire loyalist. He was sentimental about the empire. He has people talk about the loss of India. He tends not to think about the loss to Indians through empire, things about the gains. Um, but it's also something that needs articulation. Maybe that's a matter of the, an introduction. It's a placing of Coward's ideas. Um, he's not a racist in the sense of systematic racism. He's a racist in the way that many in his generation were in a very simple way. And the sum, what assumptions that need to be and have been challenged since, but which made him uncomfortable in certain, con certain contexts. His relationship with Jamaica, the place of his later abode, um, is a complex one. It's sympathetic, um, but it's not quite acceptable in terms of the way we might think foreign policy and attitudes would, come, would exist now. But you might also need to explain the Ritz bar, and I'll come to that later, unless many of you are children of the Ritz already, in which case, don't worry. The Avenue Montaigne as an address, yes, it was one of the most, is one of the most fashionable addresses in Paris, very handy for the major couturier. And then there's Clapham, uh, which we may think is a straightforward um, identif identification of a locale and a social milieu, but still has changed since um, Coward was writing and since his youth, in fact. And then there's background and performance history. And I'm drawing up what you might call as a shopping list for anybody who wanted to edit one of the plays. So establishing the text, all this business of the annotation and the background and performance history. So what are the sources that we have, the degrees of authority for the scripts that we use? There are complete and incomplete manuscripts in notebooks, many notebooks, and elsewhere of individual plays. There are type script drafts. There are production and rehearsal copies. And then you have to ask, who were they made for? 
um, and when were they made? There are the Lord Chamberlain scripts. They're legally binding on the theatre to perform the scripts approved, but perhaps not always rigorously followed. And then the adaptations for film and um, specifically American television in terms of Coward's own input and the extent of Coward's involvement in them, notably his involvement with Brief Encounter. I'm not talking about his films this evening, but I will mention that looking at the unpublished sections of his, of his diary and journals, uh, with a copy of which is held in, in Birmingham, reveals that Coward was very much more active in his in work on Brief Encounter, and for that matter on, on In Which We Serve, uh, than his collaborators, um, Ronald Neem and David Lean, and were actually prepared to admit they really resented, I think, Coward's, uh, Coward's credits, especially his credits in which we serve, which um, he has multiple credits. He's a multiple threat. So if we go back to the manuscripts and the typescript drafts, there's the question arises of when, in what order these were created and for what purpose, just as drafts. There's also the fact that Coward wrote in pencil in notebooks. He wrote in pencil on uh, different sizes of ruled paper by preference with an ever sharp pencil. He corrected himself. And very often when you're looking at these, these documents, you see him changes, changing his mind, crossing out, putting in a new word as he goes along. He wrote quickly. He was also aware that writing quickly wasn't the be all and end all. So he did actually complete a number of plays in a matter of days. Um, famously, Private Lives, he claimed it was four days, I think. Uh, certainly, we can verify that Blythe Spirit was written in six days at Port Merion in Wales. Um, but he also revised considerably once in performance. So when Coward very often says, I completed such and such a play in such and such a time, that's before you get to the actual performance, if he was involved in it. He also typed. He carried typewriters around the world um, with him as well as dressing gowns. And the type, type script drafts. Similarly, one has to ask, at what point does a typescript turn out to be Coward's hands on the keys? At what point is it an agency? So back to those, that shelf full of Coward. The editions are worth listing. There are the first editions, the British and American first editions of the plays. They're different from each other sometimes, not very often though. There are the play parade volumes, six volumes between 1934 and 62, and plus what you might call a half volume, I'll come to that later. The Methuen collected edition of the plays, nine to date, I think it is. The Samuel French's acting editions, London and New York, and not always identical. And I've just listed them there. Um, and they have different, different degrees of authority, or they represent different things. I mentioned the second play parade because the first play parade is here on the left of, of the screen. Um, and that's the, the first the, the publication in the mid 30s, Carrot is publishing major plays that he has had success with, except for, for post mortem, uh, which was not performed in his lifetime and which is, or it's certainly not in London, I can remember right, and it's a play about the First World War and um, intriguing in all sorts of ways, but it, it is interesting that he put, challengingly put it in with these successful plays. Second play parade followed, eight and sixpence worth, um, and then after the war, uh, the, his publishers, Heinemann, uh, said that they wanted him to revise second play parade and add more material to it, which inc included um, some review material that had been um, created since the pub pre-war publication. I think it's 1939, Second Play Parade. And plays were not included in Play Parade in this series of volumes. The adaptations, Look After Lulu from Georges Feydeau's Occupatoire d'Amélie, and After the Ball, uh, adapted from Lady Windermere's fan, uh, were not included. And there's a letter in the archive in which the decision is, is made clear. They're not going to be included because they're adaptations. They're fascinating from our point of view as scholars, knowing what's going on, but they're not his. Well, not really. Though the plays written after 1962, which amounts to the three parts of Sweet in Three Keys. And then there were the plays unperformed in Noel Coward's lifetime, 
Semi Monde from 1927, a wartime play, Salute to the Brave, also known as Time Remembered. He often uses the same title for different versions of the same play, of, of a, sorry, different plays use similar titles in draft form. Long Island Sound, Volcano, Age Cannot Wither, which is incomplete, designed for rehearsing a very funny sketch about rehearsing with the Lunts, and Star Quality, which uh, Chris Luscombe has made a splendid version of, acting version of. Now, these have been, these have been published in the Methuen edition, um, and they are available. Um, it's just a question of making sure one knows where they've come from, if you see what I mean. So let's go back to the beginning, a very good place to start. I mentioned Coward in 1920, and this is the boy author. And this is Coward's, one of Coward's series of invaluable scrapbooks. Um, this one is, is pasted into any old volume he could find that was a blank ledger that he must have picked up from somewhere. Um, and here's the boy author um, with his great friend Esme, um, known as Stodge, in his first, in his first performed play, uh, first West End play, I'll Leave It to You. I'm going to move on to, to mid-1920s and the Vortex, because this is where, I, although there, there's a lot of material to do with the earlier plays, particularly in the notebooks, it's the Vortex, which is one of the most famous plays, and is a play that, as it were, makes him as a dramatist, uh, makes him as a public personality as a dramatist, those two things. These wonderful illustrations are from the American reviews of the play, um, and they've been cut out of an illustrated paper, and they're exam examples of um, what you'll find in the archives in New York Public Library, which is that you'll find, very often, you'll find a folder that has unmounted um, newspaper reviews, and you get the feeling that if you, you may be the last person to handle this, it's so fragile. Um, they've got a big backlog of these things. Um, we get spoiled when we get scrapbooks and when we get the, the attentions lavished on, on this material in, in, in major collections, there's just too much to deal with. And these are photographs that my wife Patricia Lennox took for me in New York. Um, so the, the background is actually the, the, uh, the table on which they, they're placed. And here's an example of the kind of fragmentation that you can see this you feel as you open these reviews and i've done it myself with a number of other in a number of other contexts you think no one ever is no one's going to see this again uh, luckily nowadays you can photograph documents with your iphone um but uh, when i last used new york public library you had to go and very carefully place them uh, place them down on a, on a copying machine so here's a manuscript or two manuscripts rather these are two pages for the vortex. And on the left, you have in a quarto notebook, you have uh, a plan for act one. And typically with Coward, um, he would plan the act, plan the scenes. He thinks in terms of scenes of confrontations of dialogue. He places a description of the setting at the very beginning. And this one is particularly interesting because what he's done is to put the name of the actress who was going to play um, the mother in, in the vortex, um, in, um, it's Kate, Kate Cutler, in, and, then has, and then has changed it, um, maybe to make it better. Actually, she withdrew from the production. That is, as they say, another story. But you see, he's also removing, amongst other things, a, a, a complete character, Miss Hodge, who my suspicion is was supposed to be a manicurist. Uh, she has a little bag with her. She's poking around looking at letters and things on a desk. Um, clearly, that was going to be a complication he decided not to go for. So this is a preliminary plan, and it's not untypical of the way Coward works. What significance this would have for um, an edition of the play is probably a matter for the editor, not necessarily for anything that's going to go in the body of the text. We're not doing a kind of variorum if, we'd do, if we were doing this kind of edition. On the right hand side is the, what I think of as the full version of the play. There are bits of it in quarto form and other places in the archive. And this is the, the final scene of the play, um, the curtain written underneath it. And this is a full scap notebook. Um, but you can see how Coward is, is making alterations in this. 
there would be, one assumes, as an assumption, an intervening fair copy. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether a fair copy is a fair copy or something prepared for publication for, for a printer. There may not be an intervening typescript, which we would expect nowadays or until recently now to be electronic. But still, it's very exciting to look at these documents because one gets a sensation of seeing how Coward is worth thinking fast as he works. And also he thinks in terms of performance, always. He, he hears the lines in his head and you can see that happening with the way he, he races through without punctuation very often. He doesn't put apostrophes in don't and can't and things like that. But also he moves quickly, he moves very surely. And very often what he writes in these drafts gets in is what you end up with. But here's another example of alteration, which is from a different for a different reason. This is a prompt copy of the 1933 production of Hay Fever. It was first performed, of course, in 1927, 25. I'm sorry, I should should look at my notes properly. But in 1933, it was directed in the West End again by Coward himself. And here he's marked up, or someone has marked up, um, it looks like a prompt copy, um, a copy of, pasted in copy of the French's acting edition. But what's happened is that Constance Collier, who's now playing Judith Bliss, is given a strong curtain at the end of act two, and again at the very end of the play, with also with alterations in the dialogue. So you can see the end of act two, uh, when, it, when everything has gone haywire, Richard, um, Richard, the character who, who walks in on what seems to be a terrible dispute, but it was actually a performance of, of Love's Whirlwind, this play that Judith constantly reverts to. Uh, Judith dramatically falls into the amazed Richard's arms. He totters to his knees, dropping Judith on the floor. The family applaud vigorously while Judith, still on the floor, takes her call, which is a lovely touch. At the very end of the play, when the guests have crept away, leaving the Bliss family disputing um, the business of the geography of Paris in, in the novel that David is writing, we get an alteration here of the same kind. So Judith's line, as you see at the bottom there, very well, darling. Um, David says, the blossoms trembled, uh, <laughs> trembled in the in the in the, the high chestnut trees, intermingling their subtle perfumes with all the other aromas, which was spring. And Judith says, what was spring? What was spring? Curtain. It's actually a repetition of a joke that's been made earlier, but has moved to here. Now this is Coward working on his own script in a production, and we'll see examples of that again in a few minutes. In 1927, Coward famously wrote Semi Monde, a play that wasn't performed publicly until the 1970s by Glasgow Citizens Company. It's a complex play, and it's one of his technically his most interesting plays because it, it, it intertwines um, the, the stories of, I think, four distinct groups of people. Um, it wasn't performable, it wasn't subjected, it wasn't proposed for licensing uh, for a very good reason then. Um, that uh, it, can, it has characters who are gay and lesbian and characters who are both, some, as it were, um, so that gender fluidity runs through it, intriguingly enough. And it's also um, a play that had to be plotted very, very carefully. And these are plotting documents. The, he also wrote biographies for the major characters, which he often did, um, especially later in his career, and they're interesting in their own way, of course. But this is a play that's also referred to as Ritz Bar in this manuscript plan. And it was changed to being just a generalized bar in Paris on the recommendation. Well, Beverly Nichols says it was he who pointed this out to Coward that it shouldn't be the Ritz Bar for whatever reason, because maybe that'd be actionable. Um, it's a fascinating play, but when you get to the manuscript of it, of the full play, um, which Robert Hazel very kindly directed me to and photographed for me uh, during the recent continuing epi epidemic. Um, one of the things that you discover 
is that there are hardly any, alter any alterations between that manuscript and the published version was published, it was used by the Glasgow citizens and was published by Methuen. So one wants to know what the status of this would be. Um, it certainly is faithfully followed by the Methuen edition. There are a couple of me, there are a couple of considerable alterations that were made, but um, in detail, I beg your pardon, not considerable, but still to be considered, but in detail in one scene. But one of the interesting things about this is that it's there is no intervening typescript, but it was prepared for publication because Coward appended to it um, a diatribe against censorship as a preface to it. And in Barry Day's recent, recent publication of Coward in and on and in theater, that document is, is reproduced. Uh, Barry Day has put a great deal of extraordinarily valuable information and material into the public domain. One's very grateful to him for that, especially for the letters of Noel Coward, uh, which is a, a volume one has one by one's bedside. Now, so neither the 1930s, early 1930s, Coward is at the top of his game in terms of public profile. Uh, the, play, the play pictorial covers um, exemplify this, especially the image that's conveyed in private lives, the famous photographs with Gertrude Lawrence, the silk dressing gown, one of, one of many, we'll come to those again in a minute, and Coward is moving right ahead. There's an extraordinary book called The Amazing Mr. Noel Coward by Patrick Bray, book published in 1933. Gertrude Lawrence has become, in this representation, an Art Deco icon. I think this is a beautiful illustration. I wish I had a good copy of it of my own. But also Coward has written Cavalcade. There's a nice story um, that Coward was standing at one of those stand-up receptions holding a plate and a fork. And a woman came up to him and said, uh, what did you do to get that fork? And he said, I wrote Cavalcade. Cavalcade was enormously popular. It moved Coward in public perception away from what was being referred to uh, as the, the cocktail set or cocktail plays. It moved, which came largely from two other plays in the 20s. And it's a play which is part of his patriotic, but at the same time, qualified patriotic sensibility. And that's an interesting area in itself. What I've reproduced on the right hand side is a page from it. It's a scene at the seaside where a Piero troupe, they're not really Pierrots, they're a concert party rather, um, are performing and young Fanny, little Fanny, um, wins a prize, a box of chocolates, um, singing. In the version that was, the, the version of the script that um, is in the, the collection in London, um, this is, the script is almost identical with the published version on the left-hand side here, except that the songs are not the same. And also the final section of the play, chaos, the expressionistic section, quite remarkable, is not there. It's not been arrived at. And in the scene of the concert party, Fanny's song is, uh, I think, made up by Carrot. I have to find this out. She sings, come and be my little teddy bear. And a kind of Shirley Temple-esque performance, I think, of the kind that Graham Greene got fined for, for drawing attention to. Well, the story with Cavalcade doesn't stop there because in the News, news of the World in 19, March 1932, Mr. C.B. Cochrane, never one, never backward at coming forward, described in this, this, this article um, how the play had been written. And he also said that Coward had to be persuaded to finish the play, to finish with this sequence of the 20th century, with the 20th century blues being sung on the piano, sitting on the piano by the, the older Fanny, elder, the older Fanny. And Ca Cochrane's version of this story doesn't quite match what Coward remembered when he wrote his autobiographical volume, Present Indicative. What's one to make of that? It probably doesn't matter very much. And the story is, but stories repeated by Cochrane in one of his autobiographies. And we'll want to find out exactly what's going on here, but maybe not too much. It has to be said that this doesn't really affect the way we think about Cavalcade. It affects the sense that we have a coward feeling at the long period of arduous rehearsal at Drury Lane, just feeling he hadn't got the energy left to find a solution to the difficulties offered by this extraordinary final scene of the play. 
So thinking of image again, the image of sophistication is very important. And there's a very fine book on sophistication by Faye Hamill, which is very helpful on this aspect of Coward. When he appeared in Design for Living with Lynn Fontaine, Alfred and Alfred Lunt, and you've got a, a, a photograph, you, another of these fragment, fragmentary um, documents from newsprint documents from New York Public Library on the left hand side. And at the in Hannah, Cleveland, where it opened on its pre-Broadway tour, a rather fine, um, a rather fine caricature of the three principal characters. Um, this is a play that establishes Coward in another way. And one of the points about this is that the idea that there was a typical Noel Coward play is something that's constantly questioned by the fact that no two Coward plays are exactly the same. They have some th certain things in common, especially in comic dialogue, but he changed all the time. Um, he did not come out of the same hole twice, really, or not quite. As for Design for Living, well, it's supposedly written in 11 days. It probably was. Um, when I have a feeling that the, you can't tell whether the note on this manuscript of the uh, scene from the play, part of a manuscript for the play, um, Mar del Plato, is actually where this script started being written because that's further down the, the coast of, of South America um, than Panama, which is where he says he started writing it. He wasn't on oath with present indicative and he didn't actually necessarily have the diary entries to deal with it. He was using a typewriter a lot as well, but he is writing in pencil. And he, you'll find from this, for example, that Gilda actually has a surname, Langani, which doesn't appear in the play. And on the right hand side, you've got one of these plots scene, 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 scene between, scene between, and so on. There's a lot of it. And at the end of the list of the, the scenes, you've got alternative titles, which seem to be the alternative titles for this play, um, because Triptyque was certainly on at the head of the previous page, the, the previous page, but one, if you see what I mean, on screen. Um, here, Three Bags Full is the name of the play that's been written by Leo in the play that has been successful. So Coward is always trying to find new titles. And one of the difficulties, I think, with some of the notebook material is that you don't know whether the title lists include titles of works that have been finished or titles that he's considering as titles. But this is one of those planning documents. It's very detailed. He changes what he does as he writes. He goes, in fact, with Design for Living, it's a very complex business of shifting one element of, of given scenes from one place to another, particularly in the first act and a little bit in the third act. The middle act doesn't seem to be documented, but one never knows. Then let's get on to some differences. Present laughter, which I quoted from earlier. And I'd like to point out that this first edition of Present Laughter, which I'm very fond of, cost hardly anything by money standards, it was from Manchester Central Library and was last taken out in 1975. It's well worth looking because first edition Coward plays, if you don't mind having a library copy, well worth picking up. And certainly from my point of view, very valuable. Here's Present Laughter on the right hand side, the modern reprint of the French's edition. And there are differences. Play Parade has this speech for Gary in the final act. He turns on, or he performs for, um, his entourage. Go away, go away, all of you. I can't bear any more. I've got to face that dreadful sea voyage tomorrow, and then those months of agonising drudgery all across the length and breadth of what is admitted to be by everybody the most sinister continent there is. Go away from me, please go. Uh, now, there might be a problem uh, with referring to Africa as the sinister continent. It's a cliche of its time and was for a very long time. And you'll also notice, I have no desire to imitate the master, but coward speeches, every consonant has to be heard. Very important. Maria Aitken brilliantly describes uh, a stretch of dialogue in private lives as being a battle of consonants. But then when coward revives the play, himself playing the part of Gary, Gary is the same syllable number as Noel. Uh, in 1947, um, the French's edition has a very different speech or more interesting speech. I have to face that dreadful sea voyage tomorrow. 
And then those agonizing months of drudgery across the length and breadth of what is admitted to be the most sinister continent there is. Please, please, all of you go. Parasites, parasites, vultures waiting to claw the flesh from my bones. For 20 years, I've given you everything. I gave you my youth. Where is my youth today? Sent whistling down the wind. I gave you my vitality. Where is my vitality? Drained out of me. And now, I'm, when I'm nothing but a husk, an empty shell, I'm to be sent out to die in the white man's grave. Oh, oh, he throws himself on the floor and Liz, his wife, not divorced, says, go on, both of you, I'll talk to him. So, which one do we use? In the modern editions, except for French's, that speech is the shorter version. An addition really ought to include an appendix, perhaps, that, uh, that points these things out. Oh, and by the way, there is also um, Joyeux Chagrin, Sweet Sorrow, which was the original title for Present Laughter. In wartime, it was obviously thought that Present Laughter, uh, that uh, Sweet Sorrow was not a very encouraging title for audiences. Present Laughter was. But Joyeux Chagrin was performed with Noel, Coward, playing Gary S. and Dine, and this is one of the review in Paris, in Brussels and in Paris, and this is one of the, the review pages in the scrapbook um, from Point de Vue, um, French publication. Noel Cow plays the comedy of his life, or the play of his life, in three acts and four dressing gowns. And then the bottom panel rather charmingly says, and puts on, puts on a fifth gown in order to greet, embrace, kiss, his friends. It's very charming that. It wasn't enormously successful. Um, Coward was fluent in French, um, not necessarily in writing it, um, and certainly in understanding it he was, um, but it was a very brave thing to do. And Joyeux Chagrin is a, a case where the play is transformed, translated into French fairly directly. But then some plays didn't translate very directly. Quadrille, in 19, 1949 to 51, a Victorian comedy inspired, I think, to a great extent by his reading of Trollope, of whom he was very fond, has its Parisian version in 1955. This is a long, tortuous story of getting the adaptation approved and write, had the adaptation written. On the right, left-hand side, you've got Lynn Fontaine and Joyce Carey, the wonderful Joyce Carey, a loyal friend of, of Coward's for many years, um, or ever since they first knew each other, in this splendid setting by Cecil Beaton with his fabulous gowns by Cecil Beaton. This Victorian comedy um, was translated as Quatuor um, because Quadrille, or Quadrille, I suppose, um, was not available. The, the title had been used by Sacha Guitry for a play, and so it had to become, instead of a dance, Quadrille, a string quartet, a quartet, not quite the same thing. Um, may not matter that much, um, it wasn't enormously successful. It had a very good cast, Alice Corsia, Pierre Dux, very important actors. And it's an interesting case because the play was reshuffled very considerably. It's a case of a coward play, a London West End play, becoming a boulevard comedy and having to be altered in the process. So moving right along, Blythe Spirit. Enormously successful, enormously popular. You wouldn't think there'd be any problems with it. There were no problems. A few, one or two tiny questions. In the first, in the manuscript draft of Blythe Spirit, um, and here's the plan on one side and the manuscript on the other, which turned up two years ago, it is now, in, in, in the London archive, um, with Coward's endorsement, it was written at Port Merion, original script. It was written um, when he was in Port Merion with Joyce Carey. Uh, in 1941. Um, here's the, the, the summary of it. The summary is intriguing because it includes a character who doesn't figure in the final version of the play, um, or indeed in the typescript version, which summarizes what they did in those six days. Um, and it's, a, it's the superior in the Psychical Research Society of Madame Arcati, who's very worried about him and, and has to have his approval. And that character appears in um, the, the plan for the play, but not in the final play. Also in the final play, um, you don't find out that Madame Arcati's um, real name is Gladys Stevens, but that's, as I say, another story. But here's an interesting bibliographical point. 
If you look down the middle of the page where Ruth has a stage direction, suddenly seeing that haggard, rattled woman in the hotel at Biarritz. Now, if you gave that to it, I bet if you gave that to an actor now as a note and said, would you mind doing this in the manner of the, the, the uh, stage direction? They really find it very challenging. Charles has just asked, do you remember how I got the idea for his novel, The Light Goes Out? Of course, I remember we sat up half the night talking about it. Well, of course, it may be self-evident when you look at it like this, in the cold light of now, <laughs> that this is not a stage direction. In fact, it survives, though, in Play Parade and in Methuen's edition as a stage direction. French's edition, and I haven't printed out the next page, has it as it should be, suddenly seeing that this is her answer. That was what um, she's saying to him. You remember how I got the idea? It was suddenly seeing that haggard, rattled woman. And this is the kind of thing that is intriguing, but this is only a mistake, but it needs to be put right. Um, maybe it doesn't need, but I think it does need to be put right sometime or other, somewhere, other than just in French's. There's a whole question here of the authority of French's editions, that's another matter. And vintage edition, New York 1999, has it correctly. So this presumably has come from looking at French's or having the rights to French's edition. Then there's hay fever, again. A simple stage direction, a very funny one. Simon and, and Myra are having what Simon hopes will be a passionate scene, and they're interrupted. Damn, damn, it's those drivies. He takes his feet off the sofa. Clara, the maid, enters, crosses to the door right, opens it, lets it fall back in Richard's face, and starts to return to the door left, but stops as he speaks. Richard Gresham and Jackie Corriton come in. There is, by this time, a good deal of luggage on the step, and so on. And I love this touch, a typical coward stage direction. Jackie is small and shingled with an ingenuous manner which will lose its charm as she grows older. Now, in Play Parade, this appears. Clara enters, crosses the door right, opens it, and lets it fall back in Richard's face, starts to return, but stops as he speaks. Okay, so we're getting there with that. Hey, Fever and Methuen, Clara enters, crosses the door right, opens it, and lets it fall back in Richard's face and starts to return to the door left. So we're still with the same version. The vintage has a very different version. There's no door business and Myra powders her face. Myra powders her nose, or nose I should have said, as Clara crosses to the open door. They come in, there is by this time a good deal. Of, so the door business is not there. In the BBC television version done in the 1980s um, with Penelope Keith as Judith, um, the business with the door was done. So what's happened to get, how do we get to this vintage version, which is an American publication? I don't know. It's intriguing. I mean, it's no more than intriguing. It's not something you'd want to bother a reader about. It just bothers me to know what the origins of the vintage text were. Might have, might have been the original title for Peace in Our Time. There's a drafted plan of the play in the Birmingham collection. Um, at the end of this play, which imagines what would happen if the Nazis successfully invaded England, at the end of the play, the heroic publican um, is, is, it stands to attention, as you see, I don't know if you can read that here. Um, he, um, the, radio, the radio is on um, and he, he's, he stands to attention as the Nazis arrive outside the pub because the, a reinvasion is happening, liberation, and um, he stands to attention while the radio plays God Save the King and the Nazis fire through the door and kill him. So the heroic publican idea is there in the, the first thinking about the play. It, this changed. In the final version, a captured Nazi, Nazi officer is tied to a chair and he gets the bullets and that's the end of the play. When it was in Brighton, a collaborator, an intellectual, very important, Chorley Bannister, was the person who had been captured by the resistance and tied to the chair, and he gets shot. And it changed. And this review for this article in Illustrated, the magazine, points out that West End audiences are now seeing a different version of Peace in Our Time from the production at Brighton. So, no big surprise there, but it's interesting to see how that changes on the road. Nude with violin, and I will be finishing fairly soon, don't worry. 
but nude with violin um, is, is a case of a script mutating. Four actors in succession in the leading role. Gilgood in Dublin and the UK. Michael Wilding took over in London when Gilgood went to Stratford to play Prospero. Coward went to play the, the, part, the part of Sebastian, um, the, the valet of the painter Sorodin, I'll come to that in a moment, in the United States on tour and on Broadway, while in London, Helpman, Robert Helpman took over from Michael Wilding, who was in meltdown at the time. He flew to New York to be briefed by Coward on changes to the script. Now this part, Sebastian, is the most interesting part in the play, and it's a play that's a satire on modern art, capital M, capital A. And it's a very strangely Philistine play. It's really about a satire on the jargon of art criticism. Um, nevertheless, um, I'm not sure as it would be would work now. Um, it's hard to see because it feels as though it's attacking something that's no longer thought of in the ways that it was being thought of. This is a time when, when saying that uh, a Picasso painting could be drawn by a child of five was was a very common commonplace, you know. And Coward invests takes it as the pretext for some good comic business, some good comic scenes with the people who come to point out that the great artist Sorodin, who painted these extraordinary works that have earned a fortune, was actually not the painter. They were done by a series of more or less talentless surrogates who have now, and now that he's dead, they're coming to claim they're part of a legacy that actually doesn't exist because all the money has been spent. Sebastien is the, the butler come lover in the first draft of the first plan for the play, but that doesn't survive into, into the play. And he is the person who masterminds the action. The changes were very considerable. The ending of the play was altered during the tour and the act division was changed. For New York, Howard rewrote to extend his part and that of a young American actor playing a journalist. And Heinemann and Doubleday versions in the respective countries differ in this respect. Play Parade adopts the former, no doubt on Coward's insistence. That is the, the Heinemann version. But it's an intriguing situation, and the ending of the the ending of the play uh, in its earliest version, or the early ver earliest version we know of, has two art critics, two fighting it out, coming to blows on stage and throwing at each other phrases from art critical vocabulary that Coward had made a very careful list of uh, in order to mock them. Curtain. And then there's another version of the curtain in which it's revealed that it has been revealed in this, play, in this version of the play that, um, that Lauderdale, the illegitimate son of Sebastien de Valet, if you follow me, um, has actually painted the paintings. And there's the one play, painting, nude with violin, that no one has seen that could make a fortune, but if it's discovered that it's a fraud, will destroy art criticism. That's the idea. Well, here's Gilgood as Sebastien, who is described um, explicitly as a dago, in other words, as in the old parlance of, of racist othering, as being sort of um, greasy is the word that's very often used, uh, but charming and unscrupulous um, person from Southern Europe or South America. It, it's, it's, it's a disparaging term that was very, very current for many years. But Gilgood is the least um, disparaging of the performances. Coward not so much. Helpman went the whole hog and made himself look, made himself up as a Mexican, loaded himself with jewellery. It's quite extraordinary, the photographs of Helpman, um, never undersold, never knowingly undersold. Here's Coward in the part in New York on the left, in quite a nice picture. It's from the American edition of the play, uh, Sebastian greeting the family with a bottle of champagne with a mourning bow on it. On the right, a not very good picture, and Actually, this is the only image that I've seen of the painting itself. The British critics were very careful not to reveal what it was like. So that the end of the play, the final scene in which it's revealed would be a surprise for the audience, nude with violin. Um, this is one of those things that, where the typescript of the play describes the, the nude with violin, published versions do not. But Coward also, by the way, is a man for all seasons in many ways. He was made offers to endorse various things. He chose Rheingold, the dry beer, uh, in New York when he was playing Sebastian. And here he is promoting it, beer as it should be. 
uh, in his character as both Noel Coward and Sebastien. And that takes one to an area I'm not going to get into, which is Coward and the Pelts and how they overlap each other. He also got one of the most remarkable accolades that I don't think any other 20th century dramatist has had. He was given an award by the Plumbing Contractors, um, National Association of Plumbing Contractors of America, um, because he had made very favorable remarks about the plumbing in New York hotels in an interview. So not everybody has this to put on their wall. So here's Coward moving in after South Sea Bubble, um, which was not universally well received as a play, but was a great success for Vivian Lee um, in the principal part. Here's a cartoon by Ronald Searle of Coward with his bag packed for Bermuda, his signature dressing gown, his signature, though he didn't often use one, um, long cigarette holder. So the imagery from Private Lives images has persisted turning his back on England. And this is a, a major, major turn in the way Coward was thought of. He was becoming what would be called vulgarly a textile. He was tex, textile, tex, tax exile. Um, and the papers, especially the Beaverbrook Press, went to town on this. Look after Lulu, I mentioned as being an adaptation. Now I'm put, showing you these two because they show Coward between the West End on the right-hand side, the tenant management, and on the left-hand side, tenant, Laurence, LOP, Laurence Olivier Productions Limited, look after Lulu at the Royal Court. Just the image of the two um, programs from 1959 suggests a difference in approach between the two theatres. Reading the iconography of programs is a fascinating subject, which I'm not going to go into, but this caused ructions at the Royal Court for obvious reasons. They'd taken on a stylish production with sets by Cecil Beaton. They'd taken on um, performance by Vivian Lee. I mean, the Olivier's were no, 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 no strangers to the Royal Court, but still this was something that um, caused problems with George Devine's management. Finally, or nearly finally, aphorisms. In the 1960s, early 1960s, um, Nicole Leslie and the team, Coward's, Coward's, Coward's very faithful and very efficient um, entourage in London, his office, which is the source of most of this material, came up with the idea of a book of aphorisms. And Cole Leslie undertook to make a list, which you've got a copy of the manuscript on the left-hand side, and a copy of a draft, typescript draft on the right-hand side. And there's a letter from Cole Leslie, which he says, well, actually, the master doesn't do aphorisms. Coward didn't do um, the kind of Oscar Wilde style aphorism. He didn't, Coward's humor is not, doesn't reside on the whole in that kind of, that kind of statement, that nuggle, nugget of wisdom. The, the humor does not come from that. They found it very hard to find these. Interestingly enough, um, when you get really good anthologies of Coward's wit, for example, the one by Richard Bryars, um, the most, men, men, most of the examples come from what Coward said in private or in public, but not in the plays. The, he's not a playwright who deals in nuggets of wisdom. This, for example, is one of the things that was pointed out by some of the early reviewers. Finally, here's a surprise. Of course, it's Victorum Mislugim, um, in which we serve. And it's an, I could believe this. I find it very strange to find this Russian edition of the script of In Which We Serve, published in Moscow in 1944. And for some months, I wondered, every now and then, I didn't wake up in the middle of the night wondering about it, but I thought it's very peculiar and I wonder what happened. This was explained a little while later by finding this letter. I agree that a script of the above shall be published by the Cinema Committee of Moscow for limited distribution in the category of technical publications and so on. In other words, this was a one-off that was done as part of the, the Anglo-Soviet war effort. I don't know who Mrs. Cameron was, um, but obviously this is this is a co this is um, copy many a carbon of a letter that would be sent, and clearly that's how it comes to be in this Moscow collection of cinema classics, so to speak, or major cinema shows. 
finally, in terms of documents, here's one that won't make a great deal of sense in itself, but I'm using this letter from Cole Leslie in 1962 to Lorne Lorraine, Coward's long-standing um, private uh, personal assistant since the 1930s, an extraordinary efficient and loyal person. Um, and he's writing to her about Sail Away, the musical. Now, I've not dealt at all with musicals. There are a couple of reasons for this. One is that I don't have the expertise. The other is that it's been dealt with very, very effectively by Barry Day in his wonderful edition of Coward's lyrics, but also because they're very complicated in the sense that musicals change even more on the road, notoriously, than straight, straight plays, nice old fashioned spoken drama. But here, Cole Leslie is sending material for the Sail Away script to London so that they can start to put together the, the book and the numbers for the London production of Sail Away. And that raises the question of what happens in print? When do you get to a print version? And he's describing in detail what there is and what there may not be and what needs to be got. It's worth remembering that editions like French's were usually based on a prompt book that had been borrowed from a theatre and transcribed and then published and then presumably returned to the theatre very quickly. Um, and that's the source of the directions you get in French's editions, or should normally have been. Um, this is a case where it's even more complicated than that. Tynan. I want to end with a couple of things. One is Kenneth Tynan on Noel Coward. Coward took sophistication out of the refrigerator and set it bubbling on the hob. Even the young of us, youngest of us will know, in 50 years' time, and this was in 1963, so we're still getting on it. Even the young of us, youngest of us will know in 50 years time exactly what we mean by a very Noel Coward sort of person. And I suppose that's true. Well, I think I would have to say like a no very Noel Coward sort of play, that there were many Noel Cowards, caring, loyal, expert, meticulous, facile in the sense of being able to write quickly, and meticulous in sense of knowing that he had to be careful about that. And there's the coward who wanted to write seriously and be taken seriously. That raised an interesting set of critical questions. What kind of coward do we take seriously now? I'm not going to try and address that now, but I think Tynan is an interesting guide to this, if you like, or prov provocateur for this. Coward. Um, rather liked Tynan, despite the fact that Tynan was often quite rude about Coward, but then Tynan was also very canny and very, um, very laudatory about Coward as well. There's a wonderful story about that that Tynan says, describes himself about Coward approach, pr approaching him in Sardis in New York after Tynan had written a, a, a slashing review of Look After Lulu. But I'm not going to repeat the story because it might give offence. Finally, I'm doing a plug for the book, Noel Cow, The Playwright's Craft in a Changing Theatre, coming soon, May the 18th, to somewhere near anybody. It will cost £74 roughly um, in, in, in either of its forms. In other words, a tank of petrol, as we are going now. And I think that seems a suitable place, having plugged the book, for me to stop. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jackson, for this intriguing glimpse into, how should we say, the craft of the playwright, indeed, and also uh, archival detective work. I think we've got time for a few questions. So, uh, folks, do you want to go through chat um, for me? I'll put that up now. And... Uh, if you would like to type things in, or possibly even, um, I would say, if you would like to talk, I can also allow you to talk. But um, yes, well, there've been lots of very complimentary things. I suppose I've just got one question, um, just as openers, and that is, would you consider that a production now 
should be looking at those kinds of revisions that Coward made and to be putting those into any new production of his work? I think the, if I were a dramaturg for a Coward production, mm -hmm. um, I think I would be very careful about that because he made his decisions. And I think if one identifies what his decisions were, then one should follow them. I don't mean that it's the only one way of staging Coward. There's, I don't mean that Gary Essendine has to be openly homosexual or we just have to infer it from the text, which is actually the case. Um, there's been, of course, a remarkable production where it was played and Joanna became a man. Um, mm -hmm. I won't go into that in detail, but that's a different matter from changing the script in, in ways that take you back behind what he was doing. I think the intriguing thing is that the coward version, the, the alternative versions that you get in the published text are worth taking account of. And for example, if you were to do nude with violin, and I really don't think it would repay being done now, I may be wrong, um, then you might want to choose between the American and the British scripts of it. Um, my feeling about that, looking at the American script, is that when Coward wrote the extra, extra material for himself and the young actor, um, he was indulging himself to a very great extent. Sometimes Coward's, when Coward added jokes, sometimes they weren't that funny. Um, so it's a very difficult area. But I would not particularly want to go back to the manuscript of a play unless it only existed in manuscript or typescript. And at that point, you'd have to decide which of those was the latest and which was the nearest and most useful. Um, okay, but we've, on the got, whole, that's it. Ah, we've got a question here. Coward rewrote a role for himself but did he rewrite roles for other actors and why? Uh, I think he did in the sense that um, he, he, decide, he, he was pragmatic. And there's a case, uh, sometimes it's cutting. My favorite example is uh, Waiting in the Wings, uh, which is a very late play, which is a, uh, charming in many ways. And it's for, for a cast of elderly actresses playing elderly actresses. Uh, in, a, in, in a home called The Wings. Um, and he had to cope with the fact that one of the actresses had major memory problems. And he accommodated that uh, in production. Margaret Webster was the director. And that was accommodated by cutting most of her, most of her lines and giving her a copy of the script disguised as a science fiction magazine. Uh, and then when, he, when the play was printed, um, those lines were restored. So he did work according to what was going on. He, was, he responded to what actors were doing, but then he would override that if necessary. Okay. Um, a question about nude with violin. Mm. Has it been staged in the last 50 years? <laughs> Not that I know of, but that's an area that I've yet to explore. I was focusing very much in my work on what I've been describing. Um, subsequent productions, what, what Jonathan Miller calls subsequent performances, is an area that... Actually, I'm moving into now, um, but I don't think Nude with Violin has much has had um, much of a stage history, um, and it's very hard to see from reading. I think from reading it how it would work now. Hey, yes, a question from a former DSM: yes. Could the differences in the in the same printed text of some of the plays simply be because publishers were using different prompt copies yes. as their references? Absolutely. I think French is. I'm always inclined to think of, and this applies to, well, when I was involved with Wilde, I was very interested in this because, um, but French's editions are supposedly based, are supposedly based on the prop, a prompt copy. And I think that the publishers, uh, when Coward put together the plays in Play Parade, those, those volumes of Play Parade, um, he tended to reach for the first published edition. Um, and um, that's something that, that would be the way, he, the way he normally proceeded. French's would go to the theater. Um, I've just seen a note that somebody says that Nude with Violin was revived in Manchester. Okay. Is that the case? Laura Milburn? Please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Drop me a line. <laughs> Okay, a comment Thank, uh, about taking Coward seriously. Yes. His plays are deeply ethical and far more in, indicative of the feel of his times than any number of more 
in quotes, highbrow play. Mm. Yes, <laughs> yes. true. <laughs> okay, a question. Is Coward still known in France? It seems that his early London successes were quickly followed by Paris productions in French. Mm. Uh, this is Alec Aitchison, who says he has a French play script from a Paris magazine of Hay Fever, ah. only months after the London production. Can he possibly send me a photocopy? <laughs> 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 I think it may well turn up that the, this is a part of the archive I've only dipped into. Um, but uh, one thing is recently um, the uh, French Nouvelle Revue Francaise, I think it was, edition of um, two plays, one of which was Private Lives, which was translated as Les Amants Terribles. I don't know whether that's in anticipation of Les Parents Terribles, but still. <laughs> uh, um, that came up on, on, on looking on, on um, Amazon, and I immediately thought, or whichever one it was, AB Books, and I thought, for, for an affordable sum, and I thought, oh, great, I'll get that. Um, when, I clicked, when I went to look for it, bait and switch, perhaps, it was in being so, there was no, it had been sold, but you could get a copy for something like 200 pounds from America. Oh which goodness. the answer is, I'll, I'll wait. But yes, I'd love to know, and I want to do more on that. Thank you. Yes, um, yes Laura Milburn has said yes. that yes. Um, Nuba's Violin, Hmm. was revived in Manchester at the Royal Exchange in 1999, uh -huh. directed by Marianne Elliott. Question, yes. Question mark. This, she thinks this is the case. Okay. okay. To, be, to be pursued. Thank you, Laura. We have to look, and I'd love to see what the reviews are like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A question about dramaturgs. Yes. Is there any mileage in some way of collecting the research that dramaturgs do for a production oh, and well. for it to be available alongside that done by scholars and academics? Well, I have been a dramaturg myself um, and I've been a dramaturg for um, I've been a dramaturg for um, for stage productions, of various kinds, mainly mainly Shakespeare. Uh, all the stage productions have been Shakespeare and for some films by um, Michael Grandage and Kenneth Branagh and others and Chris Luscombe, um, but not, tech, not, not, as a not as a dramaturg is a term we tend not to use, you know, text advisor, whatever it might be. The research that's done for those productions is often done by the director himself or by an assistant director. So we don't have a dramaturg machine here as much. The collection of the material dramaturgs put together, well, it's up to the individual. It, I suppose it might, belong to the theatre company um, but I don't I think that's an interesting area that can only be pursued with appeal to the individuals Sh show me show me of your way you know <laughs> I, I've given um, deposited my stuff with the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-on-Avon um, so it's, for what it's worth some of that is quite interesting but that was that was really you know working working scripts working prompt scripts that kind of stuff um, so yes, it's a good idea. Do ask a dramaturg to do it if you meet one. Right. <laughs> so Professor Jackson, thank you so much for this really extraordinary glimpse into Coward. I shall now go back and have a look at the works again. Uh, before everyone goes, I'd just like to put in a quick announcement for our next lecture. Let's hope I can share a screen here. Here we go. Oops. Okay, so our next event is going to be again online, and this will be the case that our lectures will be online until, cross fingers, the annual general meeting. The next event takes us to London for London's Burning, Social Housing, Performance and Politics of Fire in an Overheated Market. And this will be um, done by Dr. Katie Bezik of the University of Exeter on Tuesday, the 15th of February. And once again, you can book through our website, www.str.org.uk. So just back. So Professor Jackson, thank you again very much. And audience, thank you again for joining us tonight. I'll put myself back so I can say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> and thank you, Valerie, for your patience and expertise with the, all the oh, well, machinery. Absolute pleasure. So good night to all of you and uh, safe travels. Um, 
safe scholaring and okay, safe theater going for those of us who can get to shows. There will be more. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.